is don't move. <laughs> this is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and we are having fun technical difficulties with KX with Ken Ludmer. And we did change the name of the show. We want you all to know that because we want you to know it's all about Ken and his yakking and his yakking with guests. And you have a guest today, don't you, Ken? I certainly do. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, we are with uh, Nobility Celebrity today. I am very happy to have uh, Guillermo Fesser. Uh, it's funny that they were going to introduce him and tell you who he is, but, and actually he needs no introduction. I'm the one that needs the introduction. <laughs> but uh, Guillermo is, uh, is Spanish. He's born in Madrid. And he had a program. Uh, he was the first one to do a late night talk radio show after midnight. It was FM was banned in Spain, but he was one of the first ones that they had this uh, radio show that El Flexo. And he and his partner Juan Luis Cano, they became the hottest item in Spain. Uh, his humor and they're talking about politics and events, etc. They eventually had the biggest morning show in Spain. They were the top of the line celebrities. They, they did interviews, they went on the road. It was like, you know, uh, probably Howard Stern or Imus here in the States, you know, that, that, that kind of popularity. So he, he's a rock star when it comes uh, to Spain. And Gome Espuma, the, the puppet show that they had, now, you come in anywhere where I'm going off, G. But the Gomez Espuma was a puppet show, and they played voices, etc. They had connections from that show uh, uh, to Kermit and the Sesame Street, and I mean, on and on and on. So let me just give you a quick little background, which will take about a half an hour. Uh, yeah, it's going to be the first time that the introduction of the character is going to be longer than the interview. But I mean, if right. it works, we can... We yeah. can. But Gomez Espuma became a foundation, and he has done such good work. They have produced uh, films, they have done commercials, they have done books, they have done musical albums. They uh, have aided the world. He has built uh, um, um, water wells in Senegal. They have helped children in schools in Nicaragua and, and, and uh, Sri Lanka. He's a journalist, and... Uh, that's his, that's his trade. He studied journalism in, uh, in Spain and then got a Fulbright. You get them every day. I mean, they're, they're so easy, right? <laughs> he gets a Fulbright and comes to USC to study film, which he is now a movie director, film director, producer, writer, on and on and on. Let him tell you about it. So welcome, uh, Guillermo Fesser. Hola, Ken. Mm. Hi, Karen, and thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, you should have said I'm a journalist from Spain, and that was, you know, enough. Uh, yeah, we are... Very, you know, he's a very humble guy, but when no, you... No, 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 because, I mean, we all do stuff, you know what I mean? You you are yeah. many things, too, and she's probably many things, too, and just meeting her uh, today. But, uh, I mean, I think uh, I'm a journalist, and I'm a journalist means to me that I uh, like to tell stories, and the reason why I started to be a journalist is because I thought I would love to give voice speakers to people who don't have access to tell their own story or they don't know how to tell their own story. And that's it. And because of that, life brought me to many places, the same way life brings people to many places and touch many souls and that's many stuff. But I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not important to underline that. Who cares? I don't think life is about what you do. I think it's life is about how you make other people feel in while you're doing whatever you're doing. And we're similar in that we both believe that any one conversation has the potential to change your life. It depends on if you're open and you can talk to people, you can help change them and they can help change you. Yeah, the only difference is I, I can have a conversation and that's all. But while you were having a conversation, you were making money, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> you were charging by the hour. <laughs> So listen, I wanted to start, you know, as a writer, he's written uh, uh, screenplays and uh, personal ones. And I thought maybe we could start, you know, we, we, the background theme today is, is 
how Latinos are treated here in America. And, and G has written two books in, that I think fit into that category. One is Candida, which was about his housemaid, a personal housemaid of, of the Besser family, which he uh, turned into a movie. And it, it is the story of a simple woman in, in Spain who, who is the central fabric in part of the family. You know, this was done way before Roma. <laughs> and Roma is, is, is like, you know, they give you credit for that, G? No, but who cares? I mean, it's, you know, uh, I, mean, I think the European, I think the European cinema, no, I think the European cinema have an approach of uh, much more humble uh, social compromise stories. In the American uh, cinema, it's always been more about the adventure and, you know, and uh, the action uh, more than the actual narrative. And for some reasons in the, you know, the late years, uh, American movies, I think, move up, pushed by the television, you know, pressure of Netflix and all those people who started to do series with a much more personal approach of the stories. Uh, moving to that, and that's when Roma finally, you know, had a had a place in the in the United States. Before that, that film, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, not every single soul would have sold on the movie theater and watch it, right? So I think the audience is ready You'd for that, and I'm I'm glad. I'm glad. You have to go all the way back to the '60s, uh, to the French New Wave where, you know, the old slice of life movie, where it, did, it wasn't a big uh, Hollywood production. It was just the story of one piano player, or it was the story of a bartender, or it was the story mm -hmm. of a divorced woman trying to raise a kid with no money and prejudice. Uh, and it had all these simple little stories about people's struggles. And I think that's what we all relate to, you know, something that we can identify with is always a struggle. And well, I, I, I think this, like, I mean, I don't know if you agree with that. You're the, you're the shrink here. But uh, uh, I think we can divide uh, the way we approach anything in life uh, in two different categories. One will be the emotional emotions, and the other one will be impressions. And we can be impressed by many things, uh, but, but, uh, but when you're moved by something, uh, it's a completely different reaction. I would say... We are right now with technology uh, in the in the field of being impressed by, or oh, you can do this, you can do that with a, this app, you can achieve so much. But all that stuff will pass, and who cares? But if somebody gives you a hug uh, when you're burying your father, uh, that stays with you forever. You know what I mean? So the, I think that uh, the 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 emotions are somehow, and through this horrible pandemic, are coming back. And we are appreciating that. We forgot about emotions. We thought that everything was about having something, uh, having more and more and more. And it's actually having access to something. That's the key. Yeah. And, and that's more in the, in the in company. That's more about having a family. That's more about having friends. That's more about having free time. Uh, we, we forgot about all that. Yeah. I was reading this morning, I was reading one of your old interviews where you had first uh, come to the States and, and went to Rhinebeck and how it was for the cultural learning, the process of learning about, you know, Americans and how they lived and, and going to the Home Depot. And then, and then I saw where you, where you started uh, really talking about how you found out that there was so much in early American history about Latinos. Yeah. About yeah. how they were, they were in places you never thought they were, and they did things that you never thought they did. Maybe yeah, I was, I was in shock because I, first of all, I was never, I was never told in, in school anything about, you know, we all grew up, at least in Spain, uh, thinking that, you know, Columbus sailed the seven seas, whatever, and went to Cuba, and from that on, the conquistadores went south, right? We never thought of the conquistadores going up north. And guess what? The first, you know, city ever founded in this, you know, uh, uh, country, the United States of America, is in Florida. And it was, you know, San Agustin, San Agustin, and it was done by Spaniards. But I mean, you don't only have to be in the southern border to see the Spanish presence. You come to New York City, and the oldest synagogue in the city of New York was founded by a guy called Gomez, who obviously came from Spain too. So you want to investigate about the first you know jewish you know scrolls and papers and history 
of the city, you will have to read Ladino, what is the old Spanish. Uh, you want to, you know, search into that. Or the Hudson, before Hudson, sailed the Hudson River, that river on the maps, 80 years before Hudson came with a half moon, uh, on the maps, that river was marked with the name San Antonio, Rio San Antonio. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many uh, in Minnesota, in Dakota, in all over the place, in Alaska, in Washington. I mean, there's so many marks of people from uh, Spanish roots being here and doing crucial stuff for this country and contributing to the uh, creation of this country. That really hurts when you feel... Uh, or you see people uh, looking at Latinos like they don't belong here and they're coming or they just came yesterday jumping a wall or in the, in the trunk of a, of a, of a vehicle. No, man. Uh, people speaking Spanish were here from the very beginning. There's a general who saved uh, George Washington as Bernardo de Galvez. Without him, uh, yeah, free, uh, Bernardo Florida, de Galvez, the English will, will still be here. I mean, so history, Spanish people have been erased uh, from history. And... Um, and that's what I, I really, I really think we have to go back to that and, and show people, not because of the past, who cares about those people in the 1700s, right? But we care about uh, the idea of belonging here and, and people who speak Spanish, Latinos, Spanish, whatever you want to call them, they belong to this country as much as people who speak in English or as much as people who speak in German have been here for many years too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were talking about... Um how hard it is. I mean, I'm especially sensitive to the prejudice today uh, in the last four years against Mexicans. As you know, I, I live a third of the year in Mexico. And, you know, when you really get to know the people, the kind, hardworking, family values, uh, generous, uh, ju just community-based uh, people who do no harm. You know, I mean, you got your big Mexican city, you know, that you have the crime like every other big city. But but away from that, back in the villages and up in the mountains, uh, you really find uh, the core of, of the, the, the Spanish culture where uh, with the music and the dancing and the, just the fiestas every day. And then to hear the current guy in the White House, you know, start to call them rapists and, you know, put up walls and make it seem like, you know, they're coming to take it away from you. Uh, yeah. No, we took it away from them. They, they, were, they were here first. Well, it's the, culture, it's the culture of fear, but I mean, um, just come and talk to the principal of the high school of Rhinebeck, New York, where I live in the Hudson Valley. He will tell you, that it's a pleasure to work with those parents who come from Mexico because they support the teachers. They don't support their kids. They, 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 you remember the way it used to be that if you get in trouble in the school, you will be, oh my God, I don't want my parents to know because that is going to be horrible. Today, if you get in trouble in the school, the teacher is, oh my God, I don't want the parents to know because they're going to come after me. You know, so we, this, this society is completely upside down and we try to, uh, put patches here and there so nobody noticed. I think the pandemic is lifting all these patches and we're saying, oh my God, there's a leak here and there's a leak here and there's a leak. And we all pretend that we didn't know. We all knew, but somehow it worked for us. So we're <laughs> whistling the, you know, the, 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 the river of the, the Quay Bridge or whatever. And, and, and this is the reality, but the reality is like, if you remove all those Mexicans, not a single restaurant is going to work in, in, in this country. Not a yeah. single uh, vegetable is going to be picked in any field. In this and hedges country. are going to be 20 feet No tall. meat on your table because all these butchery factories are done by Mexicans. No landscaping, no building. What are you talking about? I mean, it's, it's, it's trying to be blind and pretend that uh, this country is something that is not anymore. And that's what Trump is doing. He's, he's the fear and he's telling people, don't worry, it's going to be all white. It's going to be all white. Well, it won't be all white. So who cares? I'm white. I'm not scared of anybody with a different skin. I'm scared of horrible people, but they could be white, yellow, or, 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 or black. It doesn't matter. It's not the skin who tells you who is a good guy or is not a good guy, right? But the reality of it is none of us are really 100% white. Let's think about it, okay? Um, you know, we've come from other cultures. We've come from other countries. Uh, there once was a time this was a true melting pot. And something has happened where we've decided that those who are here now should be the only ones and forget everybody else. Yet we give aid to all those other countries. 
So if we're giving aid to them, why aren't we allowing those people here in America to be part of us as well? Well, not only, not only, not only that. I mean, to me, there's two arguments here. Uh, one, before I forget, let's go to the Latinos who are coming now in caravans to invade this country. Nobody, nobody wants to be an immigrant, I, 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 I promise. Not a single person wants to live their own language. I don't want to be speaking with an accent. I don't want to be reminded every five minutes that, I, that, I'm, that where are you from? I don't want to be asked where am I from every five minutes. I don't want to live with an accent. I don't want to, I don't want to eat food that I'm not, you know, uh, it's not my comfort food. I want my, you know, home comfort food with me. I don't want to leave my friends. I don't want to leave my church. I don't want to leave my sports. I don't want to leave my landscape. Nobody wants to. And your friends. People, are, people are forced, forced to do that. Now, let's think, why the Central American people are forced to do that? Well, nobody ever taught history of Latin America in the schools of the United States because it wasn't inconvenient. But go back to the 50s, this country destroyed Guatemala in the name of the, of the you know, uh, Chiquita Banana, the, the, the United Fruit. Uh, this country destroyed Chile in the 70s in the, in the name of the Coca-Cola and other companies. This country destroyed Nicaragua in the early 80s in the name of communism was coming. A lot of BS that this country has done for business. So this country has been like a two-speed country, great inside the borders. Okay, we have democracy here, but outside the borders, it's been a destroying machine, and nobody wanted to see that. Well, okay, we destroy Central America. Guess what? Central America is coming here because we're, what else are we going to do? I mean, we we pay the corrupt governments that they have. We, we everything that is happening there, it was created by this country. So so now, and I mean, this, with Franco and Batista and Perón and, and any of the, the bad dictators in the world all got American support. Well, you see, you, 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 look, think about that. Now we're seeing now we're seeing that uh, uh, Trump, who is the most despicable human being that uh, you can have in a government in any country, is friends with the dictatorship, right? He's friends with Putin. He's friends with Kun Yanun in, in Korea. He's friends with a guy in Turkey. Uh, his friend with the guy in the Philippines. Those are his friends. But guess what? The only difference between him and the predecessors in the White House, uh, this is subtle and this is a long discussion, but I'm going to do a stereotype so people understand. That was the reality, always. The only thing this guy doesn't have any shame of saying that publicly. He doesn't care about anything. But, I, but this country has been friends with dictators in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, I mean, always. I mean, I've, I've been under 40 years of Franco because Eisenhower wanted 40 years of Franco. You know, I mean, we're thinking, where are the Americans? Well, the Americans never came to the rescue. They just have some military base in Spain. It was convenient for them. So, you know, I mean, this is an irony. So I think this, in, in, in times of pandemic, we're discovering that the, real, I mean, the reality of the United States doesn't really click with the founder fathers that we all claim all the time. Founders, well, you know, the founder fathers, if they, you know, just get out of the, of the cemetery, they will have a heart attack and go back because it's nothing, nothing, nothing in, left in this country that is, you know, the country that it was supposed to be. So, I mean, the good news is like, there's a lot of people thinking that way. And hopefully there's a lot of people who are going to try to make this country something different. But man, we're discovering that we're in a bigger mess than we thought because everybody knew something. Oh, the, the school system, mm, everybody knew something. Oh, maybe the financial system. Mm. But I don't think people knew that it was all over the place. Man. Woof, it's amazing. Guillermo is someone who reminds me of, of a couple of people. One is Ed Bradley who took human stories, he made them real. He went and investigated, as most journalists do, they dig and they get the history, they get the facts right, and they, they change a presentation of how someone is known, and they, they make them real. And the, the other is like a Pete Hamill, like a, 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 a journalist writer who tells human stories. I think G is great at telling people's stories. Uh, you, you have a new book. Is the book out yet? The one about the, uh, the man in Grand Central Station and the oyster? No, it's, uh, I just finished writing it. It's, uh, you know, it's in the hands of the, of the publisher and let's see what happened. Uh, but uh, um, I'm really, I'm really uh, uh, looking forward to see that published. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's, uh, it's a book based on the biography of Marcelo Hernandez. Marcelo Hernandez is a waiter who's been for 55 years in the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Terminal. Uh, he's got a liquor bar of eight stools and he's been there forever. 
Uh, right now, the place is closed, but I mean, as soon as it opens, even though he's 75, he will be back there because that's his love, is his passion. Well, Marcelo is, is an, emig an immigrant from Ecuador. And I saw through the, uh, through the history of Marcelo, through the life of Marcelo, one of the dots, of the many, many dots of the Spanish-speaking population contributing to this country, to the beauty of this country, right? The only thing is we only see one Marcelo if we go to the Oyster Bar, or we only see one Julian if we have a gardener who helps us, you know, plant the, the grass, or we only saw one Mario if the carpenter comes to fix a roof. But Mario, Julian, Marcelo, when you mix that and you do the dots and put the whole page together, I mean, there's thousands of thousands of thousands of honest workers who have been contributing in the most beautiful uh, way to the happiness of this country. And I thought the pursuit of happiness was pretty much what we were supposed to go for. So um, I see this book as a tribute to all these people. I see this book mm -hmm. as a, a kind of a chant of love and gratitude to what they have done because it's people who came here with no expectations for themselves they came here to just just work and work and work with the hope that the new generation who uh, is now there you know they can have a better life and i think i think as 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 a colleague uh, as a group of people they never oh, they didn't they didn't have enough recognition and and we need that recognition uh, to a beautiful story. I mean, we shouldn't go there and say, Latinos belong, Latinos belong. Then Trump will bring us the, the, the other people saying, you know, get out of here, and so on. No, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna put a beautiful story there of an honest guy, of a working guy, of a guy who's been dealing with Americas on a bar, you know, serving, you know, Manhattans and serving gin and tonic and serving whatever those people Collins were asking for and, and, and being part of this country. And, and when you see that beautiful story, hopefully you'll finish in, with a question. Why are we mistreating those people? There are our people too, right? And that's what you want to do. So I really uh, wrote the book with the intention of uh, becoming a movie, the same way I did with Candida. Uh, it was first yeah. a book and then it became a movie. Hopefully we'll see in these times what happened, what's going to happen. Yeah. But who knows? But, uh, but that's the intention and that's, that'll, that'll be definitely my my goal. I mean, I had to put that. Story. I think that that fits in so well, G. I, I, as a social worker, as a person who's always looked for the little guy and always had the little story, um, when you fit that into the fabric of the culture of, of our culture here, it, it's one thing: is prejudice is lack of information. It, it, it's bias, and and it the culture looks at the person and puts them in a box. And if we can tell the story the reverse, you put the person story first, who they are as a mother, as a father, as a son, as a worker, and, and then the culture around them evolves. And you see their struggle from their point of view, where you see the prejudice in the workplace. You see how difficult it is for them to move into a different neighborhood. You see how hard it is for them to go to the better school if they're the first Hispanic going into the school or the first black or the first Ecuadorian, whatever. You, you see the story about the push against them. And I think that's what informs and gives people a different view. You see it, you see it differently. Wow, I didn't know that about them. And boy, they're really hardworking people. And they, they seem to, I don't, I don't see any threat. We, why are we afraid of them? You know, if you can get that message across, and I think it, it, more of us should be telling these one person stories. Yeah, it's about, it's about putting names on the character, as you said, you know, I mean, uh, my brother Javier, who's a filmmaker, uh, director, and uh, asked me to help in, in a project in the Philippines that we recently did. It's a short film called The Invisible Monster. We did it for an organization called Action Against Hunger. Uh, they approach us saying, you know, um, hunger in this world should be already banned. I mean, by, by the 21st century, according to all the agencies that did all the work last century, you know, United Nations, uh, UNICEF, name it, uh, the, the World Bank, everybody was like, they have their own plans and by, you know, 2000 or 2010, no more hunger in the planet. Thank you, Lord. Didn't happen. So uh, they were questioning why and, and through, the more we were talking is like, well, maybe we didn't, we didn't tell people what hunger means. 
maybe maybe when you're hungry, uh, it's not only giving you a, you know a plate of uh, hot soup, but it's welcome. But maybe it's giving you a clean uh, you know uh, jacket. So when you go to a work interview, uh, instead of smelling and looking really bad, and you you can look you know decently, and maybe you get the job. That kind of stuff. It's it's much more a social thing, right? I think we we went into the false narrative that uh, the uh, poverty, you know, the contrary or, or the opposite of poverty is uh, to be rich. And I think the opposite of poverty is justice, right? It's about justice. The same thing with Latinos. I mean, when you move things from the charity field to the justice field, people understand. When, when charity is like, oh, poor Latino, yeah, I'm going to give to this charge 10 bucks and I'm, I feel good. No. But when you know the name of the guy and you understand that the guy is denied the, the, the right to vote, but when you know the name of the guy and you understand that the guy is stopped by the police 50 times a day for no reason, then it's justice. Then you say, why? Why are they doing to my cousin? What are they doing to my daughter? What are they doing to my neighbor? So the more names, back to the beginning, the more names we put into people, the more heroes. That's well, What did the movie uh, uh, Black Panther did? I mean, to put a black hero flying at the same level as Superman. So you know how you know a lot of black kids in the world uh, fell by that? It's a stupid movie. It's adventure. It's nothing. But I mean, it was so important that you have somebody that looks like you. That you can identify with. It. Absolutely. So, so that's the story. I mean, the more names we put into honest people, workers, the more I know that Julio, Mariano, or Carmen is an honest American worker, the, the, the least I'm going to pay attention to all this narrative that is, you know, completely like, like unfair. So, so I think that's as a journalist, as a communicator, I mean, that's my, that's my reason to be here now is like giving voice to those people who need, need a voice because uh, it's completely unfair what's happening here. It's so, it, it hurts so much when we think where we were four years ago or eight years ago, when we finally got, you know, I thought we had crossed the line. America had finally grown up a little bit and was going to join the international community and have the, have the melting pot happen again. And here you have a black guy who's well-spoken, uh, constitutional lawyer, educated, kind, human, you know, with, with an intelligent wife and, 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 and smart kids. Uh, the little black girls looking and saying, hey, I, a black person could be in the White House. It's like, all of a sudden, the world that we had was getting better and better and better. And what do you know? The racists showed up. Out of the woodwork, they came, and they elect this fool. And look where we are now. He's overtly racist now, talking about watch out where the black people uh, coming to the suburbs. You know, they're coming for your wives. They're coming for you. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, the cover is off the ball now. He, he's not even, he's so panicky. Uh, it's back to the old, you know, put them away, get them away from us. And oh. where do we need to change? By God, if we get Kamala Harris and Biden, at least we get back on the normal road. You know, when we start to see diversity, you're going to see a, 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 a country that's all of a sudden going to open up. I, I think we're going to have to go through somewhat of a civil war. I think the racists and their guns are not going to go down easy. The right has never been happy giving up power. And if they lose, he's going to fight like hell one way or another to m maintain power. Mm -hmm. They're not just going to say, oh, well, we lost, you know, mm -hmm. get you next time. You know, we saw it right from the beginning when, you know, he made fun of people that were different from him, somebody who had a handicap. Um, you know, we all have handicaps. Let's be honest. We're, we're not perfect specimens in this world but aren't we supposed to be here to help each other to support each other um it shouldn't make any difference what the color of your skin is what your religion is you know if you talk with an accent or not i'm sure gilmore you hear my accent okay um and that is sort of an infringement on you who, who lives here in the united states we have to become you know more honest to ourselves and say hey you know, it's time to make a change and make a change that includes all of us because one day I could be on the outside looking in and I don't want that to happen. Yeah. I don't know. I'm very, uh, uh, 
concern about the, the times we're going through uh, because I think I really believe Trump is the result of what's happening here. It's not the, it's not the reason why things are happening. Um, I don't want him in the White House. I think he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's like a mower that is destroying so many things by the minute. Most of them we don't even see. And oh, what the time he leaves is going to be horrible though, when we, we actually realize all the damage that is being causing. But I would say um, we are, the way I see this thing is like, I think we are uh, fighting against two different worlds. And uh, one is the old world that we, the three of us, uh, grow up with and know. And it's a world with the United Nations means something, with the World Bank means something, with politicians are a certain kind of people, where the economics, the way, the dreams, the, you know, we share uh, certain values. And then <clears throat> there's a different world that is uh, millennials are in the middle, but I mean, definitely the generation uh, C uh, or X or whatever is the last one, I don't know. Uh, <coughs> is there, I think it's C. Um, that is a world completely different. It's a world that they don't have the ambitions we have. They don't want to have a house. They don't want to own a car. They just want, you know, this economy of the sharing and they have, they want to have access to, but they don't need to have things. Their concern, the major concern is, is, is the, is the climate change. And that's what they think is like, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but I mean, you know, as we speak, you know, the, the North Pole is melting away and I don't care if it's rising. So what I'm trying to say is for those people, for the second world, Trump and Biden are not so far away. They're two old farts who belong to an old world that is melting away and they, they don't really engage with that. So even though for us, Trump is like Satan and Biden could be the savior, for them, they see that as part of the old world. And I wish the Democrats who have done a little analysis themselves and tried to approach to this new world what is coming, because it seems to me that uh, uh, is the fight here, the political fight is like Trump, who is a horror, uh, or, or Biden, who is business as usual. Let's restore this to a way that more or less we would. But this, this world doesn't even exist anymore. So I'm afraid if, if the young kids don't get engaged in the elections, and the millennials never got engaged. They thought, you know, we're in a virtual world, whatever that is. We don't care about your world, people. Uh, I don't see them getting engaged uh, much. I see the younger generation getting engaged. And th these are the TikTok guys who, uh, you know, uh, bought all the tickets for uh, Tulsa for, for Trump and did all that kind of stuff. And there's hope in these guys. But if these guys don't go to the, to the, to the electoral colleges, they, they, they don't put yeah. the ballot there. Uh, because they don't believe that this old guy is going to do something for them. I, I heard young people uh, talking about Kamala Harris, what is, you know, it's, it's, it's in, work, in the world that we are, is fresh, I mean, fresh air, believe me. And I think she's a great politician and all of that. But I heard young people saying, oh, she's a police, she's a police woman because she was an attorney. You know, it's kind of a, they, they see it from a, from a point of an old world. It's like, that's not what we need. So <clears throat> I'm very afraid that the young people are going to be different chais. Yeah. And the young people don't I agree. The election, I agree. Trump, Trump is still there. The election has got to be switched to the young. That's for sure. But I think the, the hope that I have, and maybe, you know, it, it's wishful thinking on my part, is that it's not so much about uh, uh, Biden and Kamala. It's about the group that's behind them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you get Bernie, they bring in progressives, and you get Buttigieg representing gay, and you get somebody getting black, and you get some, uh, yeah, yeah. you get a piece of everybody uh, coming in saying, I'm going to be the new Secretary of Health, and I know something about health. I'm not an oil, or uh, EPA, I'm not an oil guy. You know, I'm somebody who cares about the planet. Yeah, yeah. I think the campaign has to be all these people differently getting a, a bigger spotlight than you usually give. It's usually just the president and the vice president. But I think they should be making speeches. They should be saying, look, if you back me, I'm going to be part of this administration and we're going to, we're going to change things. And I think they have to get some kind of buzz. They have to get some energy. Uh, Biden, you know, can put you to sleep. Uh, he's a nice man. There's nothing wrong with him. But... You know, Trump is a, is, 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 a, is a carnival barker, a liar. Come in and see the snake charmer, you know. Uh, and, and he's been snake charming everybody for four years with an incredible cast of characters.
much. I mean, you talk about losers and dieties and, and prisoners. And, and, you know, yeah, yeah. The next campaign is live from jail, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, definitely this. I mean, if, I mean, Biden wins, I hope so. Uh, you know, it's, it's the first step. In the right, in the, it's a step in the right direction. But what I'm saying is like, we have to go much, much farther. And this idea of being the first, you know, country in the world, who cares? I mean, I'd rather be number 14 and be a decent place than be number right. one and, you know, supported by what we're seeing that doesn't work, you know? We're not going to win unless we get the Latino vote. We need the women and a Latino vote. I think those, those are the, where we're going in the future. You know, but one thing, one thing. White, white guys running the country. You know, they, all you have to say is, well, how have they, how have they done so far? <laughs> you know, I, I love when they asked Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she, when she finally made it to the Supreme Court, they asked her, how, how many women do you think should be on the uh, Supreme Court? And she said, nine. You guys had nine for all that time. It's our turn. You know, I think that's the kind of thinking we need, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the future, the future is, is what it is. I mean, I go to schools because I have these, you know, children's books that I go and do presentations in the schools and I see the, the faces that look at me and I look at the faces and you know what, this country, I mean, the diversity is here and it's unstoppable. So this it won't be a, a, a no white majority in this country. So the question is, can we embrace that in a nice way with a conversation and try to work it out? Because I understand when you're a majority, I mean, and you're losing that, there can be, a, you know, an anxiety there that has to be approached. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But the only thing is either you approach it with dialogue and, you know, and talking about yeah. uh, and therapy or you approach it with hate and try to deny that that's what Trump is doing. Yeah. So a revolution is happening in this country. The big question is, is it going to be peaceful? hopefully, or, or in a country with, you know, so many people with weapons and so many people like, you know, like misled, what's yeah. going to happen? It's very scary. My latest, my latest campaign, and I'm trying to do as much as I can as one person, you know, with a, with a podcast and a blog and, and writing books and just being able to do whatever the hell I, 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 I can uh, do to help. But you, you, you're working against real, real prejudice. Um, there was a story about uh, people trying to come into the white community and being unsuccessful at it and, and you know, finding themselves protesting on the street with placards. And now the fringe part of the protesters are the rioters and the looters. And that has become the story rather than what happened to the guy who had gotten yeah, killed on in, exactly. in, in a, and the kid shot in the back. The story is about police and police violence and racism. And if you, like we did in the 60s, you go out in the street and we stopped Vietnam with placards, you know, a lot of hippie, a lot of hippie stuff, but everybody had a sign, not a gun. And everybody just said, Nixon's got, you know, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you killed today? You know, and we just kept singing and singing and singing till the guy resigned. And, and, you know, they're trying to stop the war. It was done peacefully, is my point. Yeah. But out on the streets now, <clears throat> Trump has taken hold of and, and labeled normal, enraged uh, citizens who should be. And they call them protesters. Now they call them looters and, 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 and whatever, and lock them up, put them in jail. The story is now about the police and the looters. And that's not well, that, the story. But that's a, that's a problem. That's that not the story. The story is about police violence and racism. Back, to the, uh, back to the Latino conversation we're having at the beginning. I mean, Trump is the biggest manipulator. He's manipulating the, the, the opinion, right? He's, he's telling stories that are the way, the way uh, he wants to, people to hear them. And that's why Latinos are something that they're criminals when they're not. And that's why there's about the looters when it's not about the looters. He's completely manipulating the whole thing. I mean, he's calling Biden a left radical. I mean, a guy coming from Europe has to laugh. I mean, Biden is the most conservative guy you can have in Europe. I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like, like right wing in, in, in compared to the, you know, the political system of Europe when we have socialism and nobody goes, ah, you know, it's, it's yeah. I mean, he is a very right wing guy. And this guy, Trump, is calling him a, a, a lefty, 
I mean, a left radical. What are you talking about? It's just like a, it's a way of manipulating the reality. But I mean, it's, it's, it's based on fear. He doesn't have anything. Trump doesn't have anything to offer to anybody. I mean, because he doesn't care about anybody but himself. So it's fear. It's fear. And he's telling, in, in his fear, and he found, he found his hardcore. His hardcore is, is there's white people in this country who actually are afraid of losing whatever privilege they have. So to the rich guys, to the, to the minimum white rich guys of this country, he's saying, don't worry, I'm going to tax cuts for you. I mean, uh, you know, uh, do more tax cuts and, and you're going to be richer and richer. And he's having that. And to the poor white guys who doesn't have anything to offer because he's actually getting jobs out of them, even though he's promising the opposite, he said, don't worry, you will have your toys forever, guns. Yeah. And, and in the name of freedom, in the name of freedom, you know, he's misleading those people and thinking that freedom is guns while he takes the rights for, you know, uh, schooling, when he takes the rights from, you know, even, even putting food on the table. I mean, the farmers, I mean, it's, it's like destroying the whole country. It's the same way, like they're coming for your guns, right? I mean, exactly. They're coming for your money, they're coming for your guns. That's it. That's the it. Whole Two messages. The amendment was before we had a national police force. Once we got a national police force, you didn't need the right to arm. Yeah, yeah. You know, and not, today's world is so is so backwards. The right wing has handled, has grabbed hold of the word Antifa, and they put it up there like, oh my God, Antifa. You know, those people believe in Antifa. And what the hell is Antifa? Well, it means anti fascism. And now anti-fascism is, if, if you're anti-fascist, there's something wrong with you. Like, what are we going to do, bring back Mussolini soon? I mean, you know, how, how did they manage to do that? Anti-fascism is a bad thing. I mean, and, and these Republicans, you talk to these people, oh my God, these are radical Antifas, you know. Like, you need well, the, the thing is we- look, look, horns on them or, Look where we are right now. I mean, with the pandemic and the whole thing, it's like that's that's the problem. I mean, people are really having a bad time, and it's easier. It's easier to promise paradise to people, right? Or it's easier to. It's so easy to manipulate people, and then, and then with the technology, uh, I, I remember we used to have discussions among people, and people will say yes, no, or give you an argument. Now everybody is quiet, and then they go home and Google because they don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, people don't know much about anything. Don't, people don't read, people don't research, people, I don't know. I mean, we live in a very shallow time and it's very easy to manipulate. And that's why I, yeah. I think Trump is possible because otherwise in- you know, I've, been, I've been posting a lot about how we have to change. Yeah. Uh, and rather than just saying I'm not a racist, which is kind of a bland statement, it doesn't really add it much, is like, what have you done today? How many people, that when you run into racism, have you spoken up? Have you said something to them? Have you challenged their belief? Do you have an educational platform that you can refer to rather than an argument with them as a way to get them to see a little bit underneath what's really going on? And I think all of us should do something like that. Uh, do you have any suggestions, Steve, what, what people could be doing now to, to help and 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 change this this racism and prejudice against latinos and blacks etc that we're experiencing well i think there's uh besides uh being racist uh that uh, hopefully there's a lot of people who maybe are not racist uh even though we are all racist and until you know education comes and show us and you know and, and teach us a different way because this is a tribal world and we all defend our tribe and we all as I started saying at the very beginning, nobody wants to be an immigrant because you want to be with your people and your people normally look like you. So uh, the instinct of defending your people make you racist and then you have to deal through education with that. So less education, more prejudice, obviously, and the system of education in this country is pathetic right now. The universities, that's for another day, may be great, but they only teach you a little niche of something. But the foundation of knowledge of the of the middle schools and high schools in this country compared to other countries is really sad and really pathetic. But I, but besides racist, even if people are not racist, and I will refer to the uh, now to the Democrats trying to do a, a self you know uh, examination of the problem and not only blaming the Republicans and blaming on the on, on Trump. I mean, there's something called classist that is not racist; it's classist. But I think it exists, and I think that's to blame for the Democrats, uh, people of the of the level of, of the Clintons and stuff, 
because yeah. if if the Republican Party became the party of the people with money, the Democratic Party became the 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 party of high highly educated people, and yeah. and I went to Harvard and you didn't, and I have a PhD in Princeton and you didn't, and I have the right networking because I was in Syracuse University and you didn't, and, and that something that the, the people can, the, the arrogance, the arrogance yeah. of the well-educated people, that's classist. It's the people well, who cannot talk to you because you don't belong to the same level yeah. of education as they did. And that's something that has to be, you know, uh, put in perspective too. It's not only about you're black. It's about, oh, you didn't go to Princeton too bad. You're not part of my network. It was, it was so interesting watching in, in, in 2016. You know, in, in, in uh, 1990, Trump couldn't even get elected as the mayor of New York because everybody knew he was a full of shit phony, you know, and, and nobody, they, he couldn't even get through. But he was a Democrat and, and all the way, you know, he, he supported Hillary Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. So in 2016, I said, that's an interesting flip. For him to come as the Republican, uh, the Republicans are not going to really be warm to him, and they weren't. There was a big faction in the Republican Party that was wondering about would he come in and what he would do. Well, what did he do? He came in and he destroyed the Republican Party, and mm -hmm. it's now a cult. It's mm -hmm. just a Trump cult. A so, cult. and there, and you see, there are people that are breaking away from in the Republican Party, trying to get some distance from him because you see how dangerous as dangerous as it can be. Yeah. When I grew up, I grew up in a Republican family, a Republican household. You couldn't tell the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. One was a little bit to the left, one was a little bit to the right, but they talked to one another, they got stuff done. Since this man has been in office, he has been the most political, he was supposed to be the outside businessman coming in and fix everything. Well, he's been the most political man that ever. There is not one good Democrat, not one, since since he has taken office, my God, you wonder how we ever got through with Kennedy and Roosevelt. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Well, the the somebody told me uh, once is like you know this this world is divided by people who wants to destroy things and people who wants to build stuff. And so far, the people who want to destroy are winning. But you know what? It's a long, long game, and let's see who wins at the end. So I don't know. I think. Uh, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm, my hope is I see a lot of people with good energy, a lot of people with good will, a lot of people who really want to, you know, do the right thing for this country. And we just need to unite all these dots and, make, and create a force because uh, what is very good, the guy in the White House are doing is dividing people and or getting people in shock and confused and without a reaction, right? When you're going to react in one direction, he does something else that pulls your attention and then this and that. So... So I hope uh, that all this, you know, good energy that is there could be reunited, hopefully through Biden and Kamala Harris, hopefully, whatever. But we need to, we need to push in the right direction. And there's so many people willing to push in that right direction. And what I mean in the right direction, I mean in the, in the direction of what the young people are crying for that is so important, the climate change approach, uh, the Save the planet. life approach, you know, life, life, the American dream is not what the American dream was 50 yeah, years ago. It'd be nice when they put that guy from Washington, the Hem Umsley or whatever his name is, put him ahead of the EPA and we get some stuff done. Oh my God. So listen, I want to talk to my audience about uh, Guillermo. I want to tell a personal Guillermo story before we go. And uh, he, <laughs> he, he's been my role model. I'm 18 years older than him and he's my role model. He's been keeping me up at night because I'm saying I'm not doing enough. What would Guillermo be doing? He wouldn't be sitting around bullshitting. He would be doing something about it. So he's made me write a book. He's made me do the podcast. He's made me do blogs. I'm doing all kinds of stuff with him. So, and, and plus, this guy is my travel agent. When I go someplace, I, what do I do? I call Fessa and I say, Fessa, give me a list. So he sends me a list. I'm, where am I going? I'm going to his hometown. I'm going to Madrid. So I, I got a schedule that you can't believe. I got morning things to do, afternoon to things, evening things to do. And he gives me this restaurant, this little restaurant. It's, it's something, something in, in Frente. It's by the telecommunications building. So Jill and I are going out for dinner. We're in Madrid. It's like, we're going, we're hungry. We go out at like eight o'clock at night, right? So the place is completely empty. There's not a Spaniard in the place because they don't eat at eight o'clock at night. They wait till mm -hmm. nine thirty, ten o'clock at night. Come to the door, and uh, I open the door, look in. Of course, there's nobody in the place, and the, the owner comes to the door, 
and I say, uh, are you open? And he said, of course. And I said, well, listen, I, um, re the restaurant was re recommended to me by Guillermo Fessa. Well, this guy lights up. You would think it was the Groucho Marx show, and I just said the magic word, and the duck came down, and the guy with the cigar, or this was, this was like the golden buzzer on American Got Talent. This guy lit up so much, he's running around. Next thing you know, he's calling out a guy, and it was like right out of Goodfellas. They're holding up the little white table. They put the table in the center of the room. They put the, the, the uh, tablecloth. They come with the flowers. They set it up. We're now sitting facing out front, and there's nobody either side of us. And he says, he's going to get the chef. So the chef comes out, introduces us. We say, oh, and he's praising Fessa, et cetera, et cetera. He says, for you, no menu. I will make you a dinner. So now I'm in a Spanish restaurant and the cook is the chef is making me what he wants, not what I want. It's what he wants. So you know you're gonna get a meal. Well, I'm telling you, we had wine courses, we had seven courses. It absolutely completely knocked us out. We we had never been treated that like royalty before. So now as we're leaving, I thank the guy so much, you know, blah blah blah. And I said, by the way, um, what is it with you and, and Fessa? He says, oh, Guillermo Fessa, he says, the rock star. He says, they're from Gomez, Puma, blah, blah, blah. He's going on and on. I said, well, what's, what does that mean for your restaurant? He said, oh. He said, one day, he said, I'm bringing my friend, and we're going to have a dinner. <laughs> so he comes in. Who's his friend? <laughs> Anthony Bourdain. Mm. And Bourdain comes in with Fessa, and he writes up the restaurant, and the place has been packed ever since. <laughs> So I just want you to know, <laughs> this is the power of this man. It was fun. Thank you so much, Guillermo. There's nothing more beautiful than going to a place and feel that you're welcome, right? And, and you don't have to look at the menu. And then, yeah, I, I know that that feeling is great. I'm glad you went through that. Yeah. 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 And well, did you used to go it's, there it's, a lot? Was that, that where you and... Was that? There is, did you use to frequent the restaurant a lot or was it just a... No, no, I like, I like that restaurant. I like that restaurant. Yeah. When uh, Anthony asked me about a show in Madrid, I, I decided that restaurant was, and it's actually it's a sweet story because that restaurant was going to uh, close because uh, nobody wanted to take care of that restaurant after, you know, the, yeah. the owner, you know, uh, was getting old. And and, it, and people should know that Guillermo does, does community service. I mean, he fixed up the uh, Mercado at San Miguel in, in Spain, which is just, if you're ever in Madrid, go to this market. It's iron glass. It's beautiful. It's just a, a top of the line place. Yeah, that, but that, but the, the power, the power of Anthony Bourdain. I mean, he was, he was, he was amazing. He was yeah. uh, an amazing human being, amazing communicator, and uh, God, he was fun. And you know, I mean, I, 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 I bring it to this restaurant. He said, uh, "Why this restaurant is going to be closed?" I said, "Well, you know, it's not old enough to be vintage." So the young, younger crowd didn't get here yet. They don't have money to be here yet. They would love to be here, but they're, they're not here yet. And the crowd that is here is not big enough to, to maintain it. So he's, and nobody else wants to take care of that. So in 10 years, it's probably going to be vintage. It's going to be cool. But right now, it's only old and it's falling apart. I say, oh, my God, a restaurant like that in New York will have, you know, three, three lines around the block. I say, well, yeah. anyways, he, we did the whole thing. Uh, he he actually talked beautifully about the restaurant. And three months later, I talked to the owner and he said, "I don't know what this guy did, but we have two years <laughs> two years booked by Americans who are yeah. coming who are yeah. coming on his staff." I said, "Okay, good for you." And then yeah. finally, you know, this now it's vintage. Now it's old enough to be cool for for everybody. So so it, yeah. it, it really survived. Yeah. But, uh, but that's but that's the beautiful. Uh, I'm not putting that on me. I'm putting it on Anthony Borden. He's the one who did it. But uh. uh but uh, that's the power of giving voice to people who don't have a voice. We didn't do any advertisement company for the uh, campaign for this guy. We just put that guy in the camera and show the food, honestly. And, and people have access to see that. He's like, woo, I want to have that too. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's you know, so yeah. that's, that's the power of, and when we have the power of talking about people, I mean, we have the responsibility of deciding who is the person we're going to talk about, right? Because there's so many people, but I mean, there's really interesting people who don't have a voice and we should, you know, help them to have it. So we're going to change the world, G, one person at a time. We're going to I'm, I'm, I'm completely Everybody does their part. 
I'm completely sure. I sleep really well at night because I, right or wrong, I feel that I'm pushing the snowball you know, in the right direction. Are. I don't know if I'm going to see him getting really big. I don't know if you're going to see that ball going down the hill, but I'm pushing in that direction, and that's all I can do. Whoever's, whoever enjoys it, good for them. Right. You know? So thank you so much for being on the show. I'm, hope, I'm glad that everybody got a look at uh, Guillermo Fessa and uh, look, uh, look him up on Wikipedia and read his books and, and go see his movies and uh, enjoy them. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you too. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, okay? thank you both for being right, here Ken. and Best thank you Ken for Take another care. yak. Okay, bye Ken, bye Karen. Bye. -bye. bye. Adios. Adios. Uh, I